Mike, thanks for joining us this morning. Oh, thank you. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely. We appreciate you joining us. Um, let's just jump right into it. I One of the things that I have been so interested in with this Super Bowl matchup, and I think this is right up your alley, is the, the construction of the two rosters, right? Because you've got kind of the, hey, get a cheap quarterback and put guys around him with San Francisco. And then you've got the, hey, make sure you've got the guy at quarterback and figure out the rest later with Kansas City. Long term, I know we'll get to Sunday in just a minute, but long term, which of these two franchises do you like better in terms of their ability to return to this game based on how their rosters are constructed? Well, I mean, that's a really good question. I think to me, the reality of it is, and I've got my feedback in my ear. I'm sorry, I can't. One second here. Hello? Hey, there we go. Yeah, I keep hearing myself. Can you – I keep hearing myself talk. I'm sorry. No, no, no. We'll try to call you back. Thank you. Yep, we'll give Mike a call right back here. I've got a little uh, – um, got a little feedback in his ear there. So um, we'll get there. Uh, we'll get back with him in just a second. But, um, you know, I, I think it's interesting. The, the reason I asked him that question is because kind of the two – the two modes that you see guys talking about in um, in terms of putting together Super Bowl rosters, it's kind of the Russell Wilson model in terms of you get the guy on the rookie deal and then you put the the team together around him because you can afford to pay guys like Debo Samuel and and Bosa and guys like that. But the uh, other side of it, you kind of got the Tom Brady model, the Aaron Rodgers model, where you've got your quarterback, you pay that guy, you keep him there long term, and then you put in the cast of characters around him. Um, to me, that's kind of the just the way these two teams got here is one of the most interesting uh, factors in this game as we try and get back with Mike Lombardi here. Hopefully we can get a better connection, but um I don't know. I, I guess, Andrew, how much do you think about that? Because it's, I don't know, it's something I've, I've been thinking a weird amount about. It's been Roman Empire in my, ba- my brain. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if I'm thinking about it as much as you are, <laughs> um, but I, I do think it's is- interesting. Now, here's where I kind of like land with, with a lot of these things, because as I kind of assess both of these rosters, I think, well, if any team is building for that Super Bowl, it's the 49ers. I mean, they they went out and got every piece in the book to try to to form a, a, a solid offensive roster. And the, the thing, what were they missing, right? They were missing a running back for a long time, at least one like a McCaffrey, and they got mm-hmm. that, and that kind of like filled – filled the big void in that offense and with with Purdy being serviceable but then defensively they add another piece like Chase Young in the, in midseason and and just look what that does it works wonders for that team so they've actually like built for this moment whereas the Chiefs are kind of like no, we know we're good enough for this moment because we have Patrick Mahomes and and our defense has stepped up to the plate so uh it it, it is a, a night and day difference between both organizations yeah and it'll be interesting to see um cam do we have mike back here yeah i'm back oh great uh how's how's that is that better mike that's a lot better thank you yeah awesome okay. awesome awesome perfect so kind of going back to uh, the question i asked you there in terms of roster construction in terms of going the cheap quarterback route uh like the 49ers or the established guy and figuring out it out around a high paid quarterback like mahomes kind of where do you see these two teams in terms of who has the best opportunity roster wise to get back to this point well, they both do. I mean, whenever you have – and look, Purdy's an elite quarterback, too. You don't average almost 10 yards a, a throw on an attempt without being an elite quarterback. And both teams do a really good job of understanding the cap. Both teams put priorities on certain positions. They don't overspend. You know, so I think, to me, uh, I think the reality of the situation is is both are going to be in really good shape. And when that happens, you know, they're going to have to re-sign Purdy to a contract. They'll have to give up some of their – other luxury items within the team. But look, when you're in a good team, it really comes down to being able to find players at economic value and not overspend. And I think that's what the Chiefs will continue to do. And I think that's what the 49ers will do. Mike, reflecting on your own experiences, what do you think sets apart teams that consistently perform well in the playoffs from those that struggled to reach that level of success? The ones that can convert the third and twos, the ones that convert the third and shorts. 
the ones that can have balance with their team, the one that can play right-handed and left-handed. To me, the winning in playoff games is about making critical plays at critical times. I mean, the Chiefs beat Buffalo in Buffalo. They had the ball for 22 minutes. They scored 27 points. They were very, very judicious in terms of how they maximized the time with the football. And their defense was able to create negative plays in the fourth quarter. You know, they stopped the fake field or the fake punt, and they got them out of three and out on one series. So those, those two drives won the game for the Chiefs. You know, even though the kid Bass missed the field goal, you know, the, those two other drives are what kept them in position to win that game. So I think a lot of it is just that ability uh, to make the critical plays. But those possession down plays, right? The Chiefs only had six third downs in the Buffalo game. They were one for six. So that told you they were moving the football on two downs. That's incredible. But most of the time it comes down to uh, it comes down to simply being able to convert those third and shorts that you need to to keep the football. We're talking with Michael Lombardi, former NFL executive and host of the GM Shuffle Pod. Uh, Mike, I'm uh, you, you mentioned something in that first answer about Brock Purdy in terms of his status as a quarterback. I know that's been something that a lot of people have had discussions on over the course of the season in terms of how good actually is he. As somebody who did this for a living for a long time, how did you? How do you reach the conclusion that you said that Brock Purdy is an elite quarterback in his own right? I watch the game. Nobody <laughs> else does. I mean, I, I've done. I mean, I, I you know, I, I look at him. I mean, he, you know, he's great yards after the catch. Why are the 49ers great yards after the catch? Because he's so damn accurate with the football. Mm. He, he throws the ball with great rhythm. He's got great timing. He throws the ball inside. He can throw it outside. He reads the coverages. He processes. One of the things we lose sight of with quarterbacks are is the fact that they have to be quick-minded and quick-footed. Right, he is both. He's quick-minded and he's quick-footed. People want to dismiss his athleticism, which is hogwash. Because at the end of the day, you know, last week on that long run, he got the ball down to the goal line, you know, the five-yard line. He's running away from Brian Branch, a second-round pick out of Alabama. Mm. You know, and Branch can't get him on the ground. We listen to Spagnola talk about it. Look, the, the 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 reason that nobody wants to give him credit is the people that are killing him have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to quarterback and play. This is truly the case of some people are so far out of the race, they actually think they're in the lead. <laughs> Mike, uh, I want to stay with Brock Purdy here because obviously he was Mr. Irrelevant and everybody passed over him. And, I, and I'm and i curious because you, you've been in so many different roles with many organizations. What was your biggest draft hit that you were a part of and draft miss over the course of your time as an NFL exec? Mike, you still with us there? I got that. Sure do. Yep. Oh, Mike. So I asked. Uh, Brock Purdy was Mister yeah, Irrelevant. Sure yeah. My, uh, well, I mean, look. I, I, you know what I learned at an early age in my career is it doesn't matter where we pick them; it matters how they play. That's from Bill Walsh, who I think probably is a lot smarter than a lot of these people that are killing Brock <laughs> Purdy. You know, I mean. I mean, let's be clear. I think Walsh, this game is truly a tribute to Coach Walsh. We should recognize this because these are two organizations that are built and run in the fashion of which he wanted to run them in. And both teams run the West Coast offense. But, you know, I think to me, he taught me that a long time ago. Stop looking at where they got picked. Evaluate where they got paid. Why is Kurt Warner a better success story than Brock Purdy? Why? Kurt Warner was sleeping, sleeping for us in a supermarket. Everybody <laughs> loves that story. Brock Purdy, always Mr. Irrelevant. Like, why, what, what's the difference? I think a lot of it is just that people wanted Trey Lance to be a starter, and he couldn't do it. Okay, so speaking of those two guys, obviously Purdy was the hit and Lance was the miss. In your career, who was your biggest draft hit and draft miss? Well, uh, there, well, I think, you know, recently we, we picked Mingo in, when I was in Cleveland, mm. and I thought he was going to be a better pass rusher than he ended up being. Didn't play with enough power. Mm. So that was an issue. I think they're, uh, you know, when I go back, I think signing Malcolm Butler for the Patriots was one of a great, was a great thing to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, trading for Deion Lewis when I was with the Patriots to get him to come in and play the way he did. Draft pick wise, I mean, look, when you draft Hall of Fame players like Charles Haley, you're just really fortunate. Mike, I, I'm I'm as we get into the actual Super Bowl game here, 
Uh, this seems to be a lot of people leaning on the fact that Patrick Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes, and they just don't want to bet against that guy, which I totally understand. You were part of an organization with the Patriots and Tom Brady that people looked at very similarly. What, in your mind, is the path to victory for a team like the 49ers, who's got a really good roster, really good quarterback, but they're going up against a guy that's just really hard to beat? Well, he's hard to beat if you don't put pressure on him. I think if you go back to the 19 Super Bowl when Tampa played him, Tampa put pressure on him. He was under duress the whole entire game. Now, I remember that was a game where Eric Fisher got hurt, mm -hmm. and they had to play the, the left tackle. They didn't really have a left tackle. That's the game. Now, Andy's changed what he's done completely. He's no longer holding the football. He's no longer trying to make plays down the field. They're taking what the defense gives them. They're going to try to matriculate the ball, as the great Hank Stram once said, and he gets it out of his hand. But the only thing that hurts great quarterbacks is pressure. And the Niners have built their defensive line around great, great rushers. And this playoffs, we haven't seen that yet. Mike, I know you're a Bill Belichick advocate. How surprised were you that he didn't get an NFL head coaching job in this previous cycle? Well, part of me is surprised, but the other part of me isn't. You know, I think that, that Bill Walsh in 1975 told Paul Zimmerman in for his book, The Thinking Man's Guide to Pro Football, that, you know, these teams that are run by owners and general managers and presidents and people like that are very reluctant to hire somebody who has strong convictions and knows football. It keeps their job intact. So in one sense, I, I'm surprised, but I think next year, of people will come to their senses. I don't know how you can stand in front of your team and say, we're committed to winning and then not hire Bill Belichick. Yeah. We're talking with Mike Lombardi, longtime NFL executive and host of the GM Shuffle Pod. All right, I've got a unique opportunity here to ask somebody who would actually know. A theory of mine is that, um, and I don't even know if it's a theory, but that the quarterback position is way more dependent on the situation they get drafted to than people realize. People look at Patrick Mahomes, for instance, and say that guy would be successful anywhere, but he also went to one of the best possible situations he could have gone to with Andy Reid. How dependent, in your experience, is quarterback success on not only the coach, but the organization, the entire process around the quarterback? I just I feel like there's not that many guys that can tr transcend bad situations. Well, let, let me tell you a story. So in 1979, Bill Tobin was the general manager of the Chicago Bears. And he was leaving that day of the draft and he kissed his wife and his wife said to him, Bill, promise me, promise me, Bill, you will draft Joe Montana if he's there. And Bill Tobin told his wife, dear, I promise you, if Joe Montana is there in the third round, we will pick him. And in the third round came and they picked Willie McClendon and Bill Tobin did what most of us do, didn't listen to our wives and got in trouble. <laughs> had, had Joe Montana gone to the Bears, he would have been great because great players are always great. But mm. what you're saying is true. When the system meets greatness, when the greatness makes the system even better, then it's hard to tell what is who who's responsible for it, right? Is it Andy? Is it Mahomes? I mean, Alex Smith played good for Andy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't to this level. So I think greatness always shines, but I think when you win championships is when greatness and scheme come together. Now, Mike, to branch right off of that, and, and, and speaking of legacies, because we, we spent a lot of time on the legacy conversation yesterday, how do you see this Super Bowl impacting the legacies of both coaches and star players involved? You know, that's a great question. So Bud Grant went to four Super Bowls. He lost all of them. He's in the Hall of Fame. Marv Levy went to four Super Bowls. He lost all of them. He's in the Hall of Fame. I think getting to a Super Bowl, you've already secured your legacy, right? I mean, which could prove them. I mean, guys go in the Hall of Fame. George Allen went to one Super Bowl. He's in the Hall of Fame. So I think that's a little bit of an overblown conversation. I, I think that for, for a guy like Mahomes, Vince Lombardi has the greatest saying of all. He said the, the greatest reward for doing is the opportunity to do more. And Mahomes is going to have a chance to do much more. Mike, I want to branch off a little bit from the Super Bowl here and ask you more of a kind of, of a, ro a roster and franchise building conversation with the Chicago Bears. You mentioned them in your anecdote about uh, Joe Montana. They've got a situation again here where they've got a quarterback that they drafted really high. They have another number one overall pick that they're looking at this year. How would you go through that process in terms of deciding 
if Justin Fields is the guy or if they need to take another bite at the apple with the quarterback at one. Well, I've already I would have taken another bite at the apple. I mean, I think Fields has proven beyond any reasonable doubt that he has a hard time making throws in critical situations. He's played three years in the yeah. league. This isn't like he has a, he's just he hasn't played. We've watched him for three years. We keep making excuses for him, you know, and has he gotten better? Sure, he's gotten a little bit better. He's a great athlete running the football. But in terms of timing, execution, reading the, all the things that have to go in to making himself a great player, it hasn't happened. Lamar Jackson took over for Joe Flacco his rookie year and led Baltimore to the playoffs. Steve Stroud starts as a rookie and led the Texans to the playoffs. Mm. Like, everybody keeps saying, be patient, be patient. Why? Great players show up great. You don't have to make an excuse for them. You didn't need an excuse for Lamar Jackson. You didn't need an excuse for C.J. Stroud. They just played really well. But we keep making excuses for Justin Fields. It's really not a complicated conversation. They said, well, we got to get a better wide receiver around them. Okay, great. So they trade. They get D.J. Moore. Wonderful. That's a great trade. I think they did a wonderful job on that. In two, two, year, two years ago, Fields averaged 7.1 yards per attempt without Moore. Last year, with Moore, he averaged 6.9. Now, Mike, can any blame be put on the coaching staff there and not utilizing him properly? You know, that's the greatest. That's the, because people don't understand football. They, that's the that's the bailout. It's like when people say, "Well, you know, Belichick can't win without Brady." That you know, that's really or you know, this is what happens. You, know, you the coach is obviously a difference maker, but look, the Bears have tried everything. Luke Getzey's a really good coach. He got fired for this just like a lot of guys got fired because of Blake Bortles. How many guys did Blake Bortles get fired in Jacksonville? <laughs> Plenty. That's a, that's a good point. Um, Mike, I don't know how much you have um, gone into the kind of scouting and, and looking at the guys coming up in this upcoming draft. Obviously, Caleb Williams gets all the attention. But if you've, if you've started looking at these guys at all yet, is there someone besides Caleb Williams that jumps out as somebody you really like? Yeah, I mean, I love Drake May, but I haven't really studied it. I think you got to, I got to get more into it. But I think there's a lot of possibilities within the draft. And, you know, a lot of it, I think quarterbacks are a hard position to evaluate because you got to understand what are the key ingredients to making a great quarterback. And everybody wants arm strength. Everybody wants this, you know, elite arm. And I think ultimately it's about rhythm and timing. It's about being able to play quick-minded and quick-footed. Can you make a second play? You know, it's one thing to run around. It's another thing to run around and make a play like Mahomes does. Mahomes, Mahomes will make plays with his feet, but what scares every defense coordinator in the National Football League is Mahomes buying more time and creating a second play off the first play, and then all of a sudden they're down the field. Mike, you've been in the game since 1984. You, you, you've seen the landscape of pro football change over the years to what it is today. Can you – discuss any memorable experiences or moments that have kind of shaped your perspective on football and leadership? Uh, I mean, I've been really blessed. I've been around some incredibly talented people. I, I, you know, I wrote Gridiron Genius. It was a tribute to Coach Walsh, Belichick, Al Davis. It was those are the geniuses that I worked for. And every day that I reminisce about my career, I think about driving Bill Walsh around in the car and uh, learning football from him, learning life lessons from him, telling me not to be a, not to be a, a guy with a whistle around my neck and learn leadership, learn about the business of football, understand how to lead people, understand how to think divergently. You know, those are lessons that have, have, have taken me as far as, as I've gone, luckily, because had without that, you know, I, I would have not been that way. I grew up a fat kid on the in, in the, on the Jersey Shore, you know, idolizing Bruce Springsteen trying to cross Highway 9. And once I crossed Highway 9, I got to Coach Belichick and, and Coach Walsh, and it made a difference in my life. Mike, you know, that kind of leads me into my next question is, you know, you, you've got this uh, newsletter, The Daily Coach, that takes a lot of those sports leadership uh, principles and ideas and tries to help people apply them to kind of their normal everyday lives. What what made you want to do something like that that's a little bit different than both what you had done in uh, kind of working in NFL front offices and in some of your other football-focused uh, media work? What made you want to kind of give a different perspective on sports leadership to everybody? 
You know, I, I was having lunch one day with the great George Radlin, who was a former basketball coach at Iowa, Washington State, and USC. One of the greatest human beings of all time, a really well-read man. He was on the stage when Dr. King actually gave the I Have a Dream speech. He owned that speech up until he gave it to Villanova two years ago. And we were both reading a book called The Trillion Dollar Coach about Bill Campbell and, and all the people from Google wanted to pay tribute to his advice. And we both looked at each other and said, you know, we should, uh, we should, everybody needs a coach. You know, if Bill Campbell needs a coach, if Steve Jobs needs a coach, if everybody needs a coach, then we need a coach. And I think ultimately that's why we started the Daily Coach. And we have really, it's a labor of love. We've, we've made no money from it. We don't, haven't taken a nickel. We've not promoted it other than when I do radio appearances like this in Omaha. And, and it's grown to 40,000 email subscribers every day because I think there is a need and everybody has to hear a message of positivity, to understand that we fight resistance every day, to understand that we have to become a better leader every day, to understand that people are counting on us, whether it's as a husband, a wife, a father, a son or a daughter. And so that's what this inspires us. And for me, I've won three Super Bowls. I, I couldn't be happier about my career, but what gives me the most joy is the daily coach. Well, Mike, one more thing to branch off of what you were just saying there. You've written a couple of books. Explain what those are and where people can find them. Good Iron Genius is a football book that's really about culture, right? So it's a book about what I learned from Coach Walsh, what I learned from Belichick, Al Davis, and it's a journey of, of really organizational football. I, I would think most owners would want to read it. I've sent it to a lot of NFL owners. I haven't gotten one thank you note back for it, so obviously they don't read it. And that book to me was a thank you to those people. This book that I've written recently, Football Done Right, is the history of the NFL. The story I told you about my family in the book. It's a tribute to, and I wanted to honor some of the people that deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, like Brett Musburger, Howard Cosell. They advanced this game tremendously. They never even won a Rosella Award for their work. And then Marty Schottenheimer, 200 career NFL wins regular season only one of eight men that have done that he can't even get into the hall of fame so for me it's it's a way to try to educate the fans of the game where these coaching trees come from how the power of television helped make this an incredible sport and then honor those top 100 players of all time that's mike lombardi he is a former nfl executive he is the host of the gm shuffle pod and founder of the daily coach mike thank you so much for joining us and uh Hopefully we can catch up again sometime. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate you. Hey, thanks, Mike.